Welcome to the DAFSI webinar. We're going to talk about thyroid, all about the thyroid. And uh, let's get right into it. We've got a lot of stuff to cover. And uh, what we, how we're going to do this is I have actually Dr. Anderson is going to work with us here again. And if you, some of you guys from Raleigh know him, he's been out there and, and helped out with that seminar out there. And uh, halfway through the presentation, uh, we're going to stop and uh, field questions. So if you do have questions about the halfway mark, uh, it will look for the natural break, and then we'll then we will uh, answer questions, and at the end we'll answer questions. I expect the program will take about an hour. Um, I have um, I'm going to go through first part. We're going to talk a little bit about what you're going to see when you see thyroid, but then I'm going to go through a case study and really walk it through quite uh, quite extensively. So so let's go ahead and get started. Uh, first thing I want to show you is the top 10 medications by number of monthly prescriptions, and this is Medscape 2015. I don't know what it is currently, but uh, certainly it's going to be somewhere in this range. But uh, I just want to bring out the idea that if you look at uh, medications, um, you know, the Synthroid is usually one of the top three. And uh, it just, I mean, it just speaks to what's going on out there. And we're talking about monthly prescriptions, by the way. It, it, it just shows kind of the, uh, the nature of, of, of the healthcare and what people are looking for. Of course, you look at Crestor and you see these other guys, Nexium and, and all those things. So when we look at it, I'm going to take just a moment and draw a schematic. And uh, here's the brain. Here's the nose. Here's the mouth. Here's the uh, brainstem spinal cord. Uh, here's our cerebellum, here's the atlas right here, and down here is the thyroid. And I'm going to draw this out real quickly. Some of you guys, please don't snooze off on me. I've, uh, if you've been to a lot of our classes, if this is new to you, I want to make sure we don't uh, you know, skip past this. So even if you're out there a veteran, go ahead and stick in there with me for a little bit. You may catch something. Okay, so here's the hypothalamus right here, and here is uh, the pituitary. And the pituitary is called the master gland of the body. The anterior portion of the pituitary is what releases TSH, thyroid stimulating hormone. And keep in mind, it also releases ACTH, which goes to the adrenals, LH, um, which actually uh, is what kicks in ovulation for women and uh, helps build sperm for men. Oh, I'm sorry, it, it uh, activates the production of testosterone in men. FSH uh, in women uh, is, has to do with building the follicle and that whole process, uh, making the egg, and for men that's what makes the sperm, and growth hormones. So there's a lot of things that actually come out of this pituitary. But one of the things that comes out of this pituitary is the, uh, the TSH. Now TSH, uh, about 97% of what comes out of the thyroid is what's called T4. And T4, the molecule looks like this. We have what's called a thyroglobulin, which is a two-ringed um, molecule. And thyro means thyroid, and globulin's protein. It's the type of protein. And then on the backbone of that protein, we have iodine sticking off of here. And if we have four iodine sticking off of there, we call that T4. Now, you do have some T3 that comes out, 3 to 5%. You even have some T1 and T2, or T, uh, T2 or T as well, but primarily you have T4 coming out. T4 is largely the unusable form, considered the unusable form. It's only one-fifth to one-tenth as active or as, as uh, volatile, if you will, as the T3. And, uh, but really the way it is is when you have four iodines attached to this protein, then uh, it becomes in such a shape that it's more of a storage and transport. So literature will show different things, but one of the things that's kind of a, out there you'll see is the half-life for the T4 is about two weeks. So once, once your thyroid makes it, it can, it can last out there for, for a little while. So then over here we have a player called the liver. The liver makes uh, taxi cabs, and I call them taxi cabs because uh, hormones are carried by proteins. The primary protein that's going to carry the thyroid hormones called thyroid binding globulin. Here again, another globulin, uh, but also you have albumin is also a carrier, uh, transthyretin. These are there's other carriers, but primarily 70% of your carriers are going to be the the thyroid binding globulin. And this guy floats around in the system, and and uh, it'll go to the liver, 
it goes also to the GI tract, it'll go to the lungs, and basically even in pretty much any tissue in the body, it's going to come up against something called 5' prime deiodinase enzyme, and what that enzyme does is it actually takes off this iodine and then it becomes T3. When it takes off that iodine, that is the T3 that comes over here, and here's the DNA of the cell. It lands on what's called a nuclear receptor. It's called a nuclear receptor because it lands on the DNA. One nuclear receptor per cell. It lands on that. It literally makes that DNA come or the cell come alive because this is what activates it to make protein. Of course, one of the big deals is building with that protein is mitochondria, but not just mitochondria. It's building the proteins that make the things of life. Um, of course, this is going to be bound for a while till right before it releases, and it releases and then goes there. But this guy right here, this guy right here, also travel back, and it's a negative feedback loop, so that the brain always knows what's going on. So that's the reason why when somebody has a high TSH, it's a signal that the brain is saying that, hey, there's not enough thyroid out here. Now, keep in mind that, and this is a very important point when we talk about thyroid, this is like major, major, and that's this. The thyroid gland is merely a responding gland. It does not have a brain in it. It's not making adaptations. It's not, um, it's not making decisions on what needs to happen. It's not, uh, certainly somebody could have an unhealthy thyroid and need maybe some selenium, iodine, and a few things like that, uh, zinc, and, and different things we know that are good food for the thyroid. But keep in mind that the thyroid is a responding organ, a responding gland, and it is the brain that's actually driving this and this feedback loop is actually um, determining or what the brain senses what's in the body will determine how it reacts. We also have one big stop in the way and that's this guy right here. This 5' prime deiodinase enzyme can get messed with and sometimes we don't convert well. We're going to cover all this. If you've not seen this before, I just wanted to put it out there. So let's get going. So some important concepts. Thyroid disorders are uh, usually secondary to underlying predisposing or exacerbating factors. Amen. That's exactly what I'm talking about. Generally not thyroid problems. There certainly are thyroid problems, which we'll discuss here in a minute. But primarily, and I don't know, I, I don't know what the stat is on it. I'm going to say 90%, 80%, I don't know, a whole bunch of folks that I see that I actually go through the process and diagnose with an underactive or a functional or a frank hypothyroid, um, you know, most of these folks are not primary. Most of these folks are secondary, tertiary, and other things. It's coming from maybe uh, sedentary lifestyle, dietary problems, low-grade infections, blood sugar dysregulation, liver messed up, there's a brain problems, brain to gut, uh, communication problems, a lot of things can cause that. So. The thyroid is the most important uh, hormone in fetal development and health, yet over half of all women are hypothyroid during pregnancy. Now, keep this in mind. This is kind of getting to the weeds early, and I apologize for this. Some of you guys are more advanced, so I have to put this out here. But estrogen, estrogen loves, and I mean absolutely loves, the thyroid binding globulin. And, and by the way, and it doesn't sound right, but it actually has a higher affinity for it than the thyroid hormone itself. And the, and the estrogen will suck up the albumin, suck up the thyroid binding globula, and so on and so forth. <clears throat> and what happens as a response is your liver is going to make a bunch more of the thyroid binding globulin. And so when it does that, <clears throat> now the estrogen's satisfied, but now you've got... Um, you know, you've got your thyroid that's bound up everywhere, your T4 is bound, your T3 is bound, and it can't get anywhere. So really what you have is when somebody has high estrogen, you are giving them a, uh, at least a functional hypothyroid. Hello, ladies who are on birth control pills. Every lady that's on a birth control pill has a functional hypothyroid every single one of them. So, but anyway, when a lady gets pregnant, of course, she's going to make more thyroid. So if she has a bent towards low thyroid problems, bingo, bango, now we've got a problem. And by the way, I do a lot of work with uh, uh, fertility, infertility. We do a lot of work with uh, ladies who've had miscarriages and so on and so forth. 
And I would say one of the top reasons I find for the miscarriage is in our functional work. There's other reasons, you know, structural. There's other things that can go on. But one of the things that we, that I believe, and I, because we can't really, um, I don't know that we really can know this, but one of the things that makes most sense, because what I see from my labs and how the patients present, is a lady has an underfunctioning thyroid. And by the way, while I'm here, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say one more thing, and then I'm going to step off of it. If I have a lady that is pregnant, that first trimester, I'm going to keep that TSH below 2.5, so I'm going to monitor that. And if it's, if it's hovering at that 2 range, I'm going to check it every week or two. And uh, I have found it's safe, and, it, and the companies will say it's safe. I will use the thyroid glandulose cases in, in low dosage and, and help bring that down. Okay, so I was there, so I wanted to just cover that. I got to get on to my presentation. I just didn't want to leave that uh, laying out. There's too important, and I know you guys can save some lives with that. Okay, so traditional MDs prescribe thyroid replacements such as Synthroid, Levothyrox, and Cytomel. And guess what? These are most effective for what? primary hypothyroid primary hypothyroid now if you find a secondary hypothyroid and somebody's on on synthroid and they're feeling pretty good on it don't try to take them off of it actually the the thyroid hormones out of drugs as far as drugs are concerned are probably the least noxious i'm not that i'm not in that much of a hurry to get them off of them and certainly we will help what people walk off of them in certain cases but i'm not in a big hurry to get them off of them okay clinical presentations fatigue cold insensitivity, weight gain, constipation, cramping, edema, dizziness, and muscle weakness, low libido, depression. Let me just give you what I would call the big five or the big four. Uh, number one, people are going to come in and they're going to tell you that they are fatigued. Number two, they're going to have weight gain generally. And, and some of them are even eat, eating less than they used to. And the reason why they're eating less than they used to is because they're trying to lose weight, but they can't, right? Um, they're going to have brain fog. Brain fog. Now, it they get it. It's it's like this um, this saw that cuts both ways. If you have brain fog, it's because your brain is inflamed. Brain fog is I go to a room, I forgot what I was doing. I can't concentrate. When I'm in a concentration, I can't pull up that word. I can't remember what happened yesterday. I can't people remember people's names. Brain fog. I'm just in a fog. There's a lot of things that we can call brain fog, but. The brain has no pain sensors in it, so when somebody has brain fog, it is a sign that their brain is inflamed. So, guess what? A low-grade or high-grade, a chronic inflammatory process, a chronic inflammatory process is probably the top cause, or at least one of the top causes of functional hypothyroid. So somebody can have chronic inflammation, and it's manifesting as hypothyroid, but also that chronic inflammation is giving them brain fog. But guess what? There's also one other thing, and that's this. You have something in your brain called acetylcholine. Acetylcholine. You know, acetylcholine is a very, um, is it drives a lot of different areas. It has a lot to do with the basal ganglia, but it also has a lot to do with the hippocampus. Hippocampus is where we store memory. It's where we... Uh, it, it has something to do with cognition, it has something to do with sleep wake cycle. But basically, the bottom line is this acetylcholine gives speed to the brain. So, in other words, when you have the uh, neurotransmitter acetylcholine, one of its primary jobs is to give speed to the brain, and guess what? You need T3 to be able to make acetylcholine. So you get a double-edged sword, double whammy on the sword. You get chronic inflammation that's causing brain fog, and then you get T3 that's low because the hypothyroid is at least functionally low, even if it's not on lab low, it's functionally low, and then you get a low ACTH. So a low ACTH. So that's that's kind of the double-edged uh, whammy right there. Boy, I have made a mess of this. So this is my one, two, three, and I'm going to make a little bit of a mess here. So brain fog, and I'm going to say another one can be depression, and another one can be constipation. Constipation. So depression, constipation, brain fog, weight gain, fatigue, there's other signs and symptoms. But that's just kind of a quick down and dirty. Hyperthyroid, not going to spend a lot of time on this. I just wanted to put those up there because uh, sometimes people will have Hashimoto's, and Hashimoto's does not equal, does not equal hypothyroid. It does not equal that. 
because you could have Hashimoto's and have hyperthyroid or hypothyroid. You can even have Hashimoto's and not display it, you know, either one of those symptoms you're generally going to. But it depends on what the immune system is doing to those thyroid peroxidase antibodies, whether, whether it's in an active stage and all of a sudden you're spitting all kinds of thyroid out, or maybe it's, um, it's a, a block in the process where now the iodine is not attaching to the thyroid glob, you know, you're not getting the thyroid hormone. So, so Hashimoto's autoimmune can be a wild card. It is not necessarily, it usually manifests as cyclothyroid, but it doesn't have to. But I put these symptoms in here because you could have somebody comes in and say, I have heart palpitation. I have diarrhea, I have ocular swelling, and I have uh, fatigue, I have um, uh, weight gain, uh, I have brain fog. What are you seeing here? You're seeing a mix between the two because it's, you know, it's, it's bumping it both ways. Okay, here's just a, uh, something you can look at. I'm going to put this uh, PowerPoint up on the Facebook page so everybody can have a chance to look at it. We kind of just went through that. Uh, arthritis, a lot of chronic achy pains with our, with our uh, thyroid. So look, let's look at some signs here. You see this right here? It's one of the things I look at right here is you see that puffiness under that eye. When you see that puffiness under the eye, it doesn't mean that it's thyroid, but it's an indication that, boy, it could be a thyroid. You know, kidneys that are bad and other things can do that. But if you see that very specific edema right there, a mix edema right there, we're, that's going to be a thyroid. And you see it right here. You see that right there. And this is, looks like a before and after, but, but you see that right there. And those dark circles right there in adults, a lot of times I think about adrenals. But keep in mind, you remember from that very first slide I showed that I drew, that I was showing how the pituitary speaks to the thyroid in the form of TSH, but it also speaks to the adrenals. When you start having problems with the hypothyroid, and it's a secondary, which means that something's going on in the pituitary, pituitary fatigue from, you know, chronic inflammation, whatever, you can also bog down those adrenals. So I like to say it this way, thyroid and adrenals are cousins, all right? So somebody has a problem in that neural loop that feeds from the brain to thyroid, the body back to the brain, they can a lot of times have a problem with how the brain speaks to the adrenals, the adrenals after the body, the body back, the body back to the brain and the adrenals. Those adrenal loops or thyroid loops can be out of whack because of this chronic inflammation. Here's a big one we look at. It's the lateral third of the eye and the way I do it is I take the outside of the eye right there and I just look up there and I want to see how much hair is there relative to here. Now you're always going to see a little bit less. But if you see just a few hairs there or no hair there, it's a really good sign. As a matter of fact, we'll go as far as to say that one is pathognomonic. So in other words, you see that, you've got a low thyroid. I don't care what the labs say. You have a low-functioning thyroid. Keep in mind on the labs, uh, but, oh, look at this lady right here. Oh, my goodness. Yeah, that's going to be a hypothyroid. But keep in mind, in the labs, when you're looking at labs, you're looking at what's floating in the blood. You're not looking what's going on in the tissues, so therefore that's why somebody can go to a medical doctor or, a, or any kind of doctor and they'll look at it and say, well, I've looked at your labs. I see your, your symptoms look like thyroid, but your labs are normal, so it's not thyroid. That is incorrect. <clears throat> you do not judge that based on your labs alone. You have to put these things in I'm talking about right here. Sometimes this is not a great depiction here because but you might see a little bit of a swelling down there. Sometimes people will say I have trouble swallowing. I know I've had more trouble swallowing you. Of course you'll go down there and palpate that and uh, if you have a, a real skinny lady, um, you're, you might be able to palpate that thyroid. But if you have a you know a, an average sized lady or a man, you know, you really shouldn't be able to palpate that thyroid. And that thyroid's going to be located right down here. It has that little isthmus right there. So that's kind of where you're going to just put your hands right there. And you can have them swallow, and you shouldn't be able to feel it go up and down. If you feel it, it doesn't mean that there's not nodules if there's a hard, firm thing in there. But you might just feel it swollen up. It has edema in it because, you know, quite frankly, um, it's just inflamed. Um, and here's some other good signs. This is one I look at. Uh, when you see this, this specifically is called scalloping. We call this scalloping, uh, scalloping on the tongue. When you have scalloping on the tongue, it means that the, the tongue is swollen. It is inflamed. The body's inflamed, and when it gets inflamed, it will manifest 
and actually pushing that out and you're going to get scalloping on your tongue. But here's the thing. <clears throat> this is a very specific type of a scalloping. A lot of times we'll see that with thyroid. You could have just somebody inflamed and have scalloping. It doesn't mean it's not pathognomonic, but certainly you want to look at it. Uh, this is another good sign, capillary refill time. Because what happens when somebody has low thyroid, they start having low circulation in the, um, in the hands and feet. When you have low circulation, you have, um, you know, that's because what happens when, you're, when you go low thyroid, uh, your sympathetic nervous system revs up and the blood leaves the gut, goes to the big muscles, but it also leaves the, the hands and the feet. So the hands and the feet get cold and you get a capillary refill. And because you don't have good circulation, especially in the feet, you can start fungal toes. Keep in mind that trash is going through the body all the time. You're making trash just by normal metabolism, and your body has to get rid of it. Well, just from gravity, all this junk is going to go to your feet. And if you don't have good circulation down there, your white blood cells simply can't keep up with that. And keep in mind that funguses are opportunistic infections, so they're going to start these opportunistic type infections. This is a classic sign of a mixed edema. Also, this is a big one. I'll look at this one. I see this one very commonly. Dry skin. If you see dry skin, it doesn't mean that they have a low thyroid, but you know what? It's a good chance they might, so you want to look at that. All right, so uh, loss of hair. Some people kind of know about that one. Here's a dry skin. That's a big knuckle. Um, here's, you know, even this much dry skin, which is a lot, I would consider that enough of a dry skin that if I had two or three other things, maybe the loud throw of the eyebrows, maybe puffiness under the eyes, the scalloping on the tongue, and I see that, even before I see my labs, I know we have a functional hypothyroid. I don't know if it's what's causing the problem. I don't know why it's there, but it their body's manifesting in this hypothyroid uh, loop. Here's another one right here. Um, of course, the way the brain works, you're going to have, you know, in this particular person, you're basically seeing probably a weak right brain because the right brain controls the left side. You probably see this person has more problems on the left side, and it just manifests. She has, you know, you don't just have hypothyroid on one side of your body, but if you have hypothyroid, the weakest place is going to generally show. So lots of aches and pains on these people. Um, you know, they go into the chiropractic office and you know they get adjusted, and then they come back next week and they get adjusted again. They get back next week, they get adjusted again. You keep on doing that until they get tired of coming every week, or you get tired of seeing them every week, or whatever the case may be. And it just goes on and 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 on. Now I'm all about chiropractic. I'm all about above, down, inside, out, and I believe in the power of the adjustment. There's no question about that. But when somebody has a blood sugar dysregulation that's not clearing up, or they've got a low-grade infection, or the liver's not functioning right for some reason, or whatever it is, or they have a frank primary hypothyroid that's going on because of an autoimmune, or whatever the case may be, we need to address those issues because if we don't address those issues, these people are getting adjusted way more than they need to, and I'm not against adjusting. You didn't hear me say that. What I'm saying is, is what I'm for is always finding out what's causing the problem and what's going on. Fatigue, of course we know that. People just don't feel like getting out of bed, and this also kind of gives a face of depression possibly. Here's a few other signs. Uh, cold hands, cold feet. We talked about this. PMS, that's a big one. Uh, keep in mind, this is so important. I'm just, this is a clinical pearl for you. But thyroid hormone is completely dependent upon progesterone. So if, if a lady has low progesterone, she's going to likely have low thyroid. But guess what? Low thyroid will cause low progesterone. And one of the top reasons, we do a lot of hormone work with ladies, one of the top reasons we see for ladies having irregular periods, PMS, these things are because of low progesterone. Now keep in mind, we have something called estrogen dominance. Estrogen dominance, you can have normal, you can have high, or you can even have low estrogen and still have estrogen dominance. It's all dependent on your progesterone levels. Guess what eats up the progesterone worse than anything that I that's a bad statement for me to make like because there could be other things but blood sugar dysregulation is the big nemesis big nemesis of progesterone so here's the clinical part you have somebody with PMS get their blood sugar lined out and so many times 
that PMS is either going to completely go away or improve dramatically, and then you have to figure out what else is going on, maybe adjusting or whatever. It's just going to clear it all the rest of the way out. Okay, so chronic infections. These people get chronic infections. Their weakness, ascites. This is that central obesity. They start, they start gaining weight in the midsection. They can't get rid of it because once the thyroid starts going down, who's its cousin? Adrenals. Once adrenals go down, now you're messing with cortisol. Cortisol gives you the belly fat. You know, all that stuff just fits in there. It just, just goes that way. Elevated or depressed cholesterol. You're not going to have depressed cholesterol with a low thyroid generally. But you can, have, you can, you can, because somebody have a congested liver and, you know, they still have a hypothyroid. But most times you're going to see an elevated cholesterol. Low vesemal rub, malacrate. We talked about these two right here. Heart palpitations, constipation, depression, hypochlorhydra. You need thyroid hormone as well as cortisol. You need both of these guys to activate your stomach to make hydrochloric acid. So if you have low thyroid and or low cortisol, you're going to have low H HCL. You have low HCL. You're not going to absorb protein well. You're not absorbing calcium well. You're not absorbing B12 well. You're not absorbing iron well. Just go on down the list. You got a big problem if you're not if you don't have a good complement of HCL. Okay, so more signs and symptoms, and then we're going to get to the case. We're going to be at the halfway mark, and then we'll do the case in the last 30 minutes. Uh, morning headaches that wear off uh, as the day progresses. Hypersensitive to care. Itchy skin, dry itchy skin. That's good. That's that's enough on that. Uh, diminished uh, heel. Uh, you know what? You're going to have diminished reflexes on these hypothyroid cases uh, regardless. But let me just say this for sure. The classical uh, sign is a, an Achilles heel, a DTR that's diminished. And get down there and, and you know, you're going to check the uh, quadriceps, check the Achilles. We should be doing reflexes and dermatones on every patient. It doesn't take that much time, so we should be doing that. <clears throat> and of course, palpation of the thyroid gland, you're looking for edema, uh, enlargement, looking for nodules, goiters. If you feel a nodule and it's hard and it's over a centimeter, then I'm really going to go ahead and send that one out for ultrasound just to get it checked. So it's over one centimeter big um, and it's, it's, it's a firm, uh, firm nodule. This guy's going out to get checked. But if I feel uh, edema, enlargement, or just a, a nodule that's smaller than that, and it's not marginal, but it's just very small, I'm not going anywhere with that. We're going to leave. We're just going to leave that alone. Okay, here's our case right here. But I got I have to do a wrap up here uh, before I get into questions. Okay, so let's talk about it. Okay, so the very first thing we're going to look at um, when somebody comes in, what are the complaints that we're going to hear? They're going to talk about having fatigue. They're going to talk about weight gain. They might talk about brain fog, depression, constipation. Those are kind of the big five. You might find others, but those are kind of the big five. You might find digestive disorders. They might even complain of dry skin, um, you know, those kind of things. Physical exam. Here's the main things you're going to see. Look for the lateral third of the eyes, okay? You want to look for the, 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 the myxedema under the eyes. You want to look for the scalloping on the tongue. So you could look at somebody literally in two seconds and, sit and look at them and say, lateral third, uh, no, you know, puffiness under their eyes, stick your tongue out, scalloping, boom. you got three of your signs right there. Uh, you can look for dry skins on the knuckles, but the best place to, I find is on the heels. So you can look for dry skin. You're going to look for uh, um, uh, those are the basic signs. Uh, you're going to look for fungals on the nails. You're going to look for capillary refills time. They have fungus on their toenails and capillary refill time slow. It's not necessarily a thyroid, but certainly if you see these other things, you're kind of clued in on it. Okay? All right. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to open this up for questions. Dr. Anderson, are you there? Okay. Dr. Anderson. Dr. Anderson, are you there? If I, I might have you muted, so hold on just a second. Oh my goodness, we've got a load of people on this on this uh, webinar, and I'm so happy about that. That's fantastic. Okay, let me get up here. I'm looking, I'm looking, I'm looking, and uh, my eyes are not seeing it. Okay, I, I'm just going to look for questions myself. I don't see. I do have a question here, 
I'm going to do my best to do this myself. Oh my goodness. Uh, he was trying microphone not working. Okay, so microphone not working. Okay. All right. Test one, two. Test one, two. And let me go here. Let me try one more time with, and, and I'm going to bounce around here. I've got a Teresa Anderson. I've got yours. Can you hear me? Test one, two. Okay. So I'm going to roll forward. I don't know. Somebody uh, text me if things aren't working right. Uh, uh, Teresa, if you're listening, you can text me and tell me I'm not having audio. If anybody's out there and has my text number, let me know if I've got audio or not. Okay, so let's get on with the case. Uh, actually, I've been enjoying myself. I hope everybody gets the benefit of what I've been talking about. Okay, so let's move forward. Case study. Uh, 60 year old. And this lady just came into my office last week. So uh, this lady just came in. Oh, hold on just a second. I'm not uh, getting. Hold on just a second. I have to look at something real quick. Yes. Okay. Very good. I got a confirmation. Very good. Okay. So 60 year old female came into the office last week uh, and she had a kidney infection six months ago and uh, she took antibiotics. Actually, it's September, so it might have been five months ago. Uh, she took antibiotics and it went away and then two weeks ago it returned. So she had been a, a patient in our clinic. I had not seen her. Uh, this is the first time I had seen her, but she um, uh, had been a, a patient sometime in the past. So um, when she came in, she said, uh, after talking to her, she's concerned about diabetes because she had people in her family with diabetes and also cardiovascular disease. The patient relates that she is significantly fatigued, has had, now that could be infection, keep in mind, has had weight gain that she can't get rid of over the past five years or so. Um, dry skin, constipation, brain fog. What are we already thinking? She has dry skin, constipation, brain fog. She's already told you. Uh, hair thinning. She's already told you. Now, hair thinning could be in a menopausal lady. It can be low testosterone, so don't just jump on that. So she also has elevated, chronically elevated cholesterol. So let's look and see. So she filled out the metabolic assessment form. If you don't know what the metabolic assessment form is, you can go to the Pro Health Seminars website, and I don't know the address. I think it's ProHealthSeminars.com. If it's not, just Google it. But anyway, there's a resource where we have all of our handouts, and if you have a problem there, um, call uh, call our office and uh, you know have them help you walk through that. But anyway, if you're not doing metabolic assessments, I highly encourage you to do it. And the reason why is because when I do metabolic assessment, it's not to diagnose somebody's problem. I'm not trying to diagnose them with diabetes. I'm not trying to diagnose them with Crohn's disease. I'm not trying to diagnose them even with hypothyroid. Uh, now, I do have a responsibility when people come in to make a diagnosis uh, if that's warranted, but most of my people don't really need a diagnosis. They're just sick. There's not something they can put a label on. So the metabolic assessment form goes through and it looks at very functional foundational elements. It looks like things like blood sugar, your adrenals, your, your thyroid, your liver. It looks at very basic fundamental elements to your system that if these things aren't working right, your body can't work right. So to give you an example, when we look at this right here, we see uh, on this section right here, here's my low blood sugar section, and we have irritable if meals are missed. That's a sign of, of sugar dysregulation. Feeling shaky, jittery tremors, that's a sign of dysregulation of the sugar. We went through that in a previous, mod, uh, previous webinars and modules. I don't have time to go through. Easily agitated, upset, poor memory. All of these things can be from sugar, blood sugar dysregulation. Guess what? Blood sugar dysregulation is the enemy of thyroid function. So looking at a few more of these things right here. Eating does not relieve fatigue or relieve cravings for sugar. Watch that. And a waist girth is equal or larger to the hips. Hello cortisol. Hello thyroid, right? Difficulty losing, uh, losing weight. Those are big ones. Um, crave salt. Um, Weak nails, that's another one. I didn't really point that out. I didn't put that on. I should have, but you have weak nails for, for low thyroid as well. Slow starter in the morning, you see all that. Um, tired and sluggish, uh, gains weight easily. So this is somebody trying to lose weight, but they're lose, you know, but they're but they can't uh, can't lose it. Uh, thinning hair, we saw that right there. Spells of mental fatigue. 
that's a that's a also kind of a hallmark sign, not a hallmark sign, but it's consistent with thyroid. Looking at this right here, increased uh, sex drive. Uh, okay, we've got all that. All right, so I put on. I didn't put this on this. This this uh, metabolic assessment form asks list. The, it says list the three worst foods you eat during the average week. She eats cheese, bread, pasta. Oh my, right. Uh, fruits, veggies, nuts, and seeds. She eats a lot of this. Now watch this. I think this is interesting. Cardio Edge is nutrition used to lower cholesterol. That's what it's. It's not a red re, uh, red rice yeast, uh, but it is some something that actually lowers cholesterol. Berberine is something people use when they have insulin resistance to help lower sugar. And methyl renew, of course, that's a, a special methylated type of B vitamin. So her blood pressure, 128 over 62, weight 191, not a lot there. Of course, weight's probably too much. So what do you observe? Now, the first thing I would observe when I look at this, of course, would be the thinning of the hair. You see that right there? I've got quite a bit of thinning on the hair. So this is, this is the patient. Um, and looking at the lateral third of the eye, you see this lateral third right there? What's going on out here? There's nothing there. So let me just say this. Game over. Uh, we scored a touchdown in the field goal which, or in the extra point. It's already there. This is a hypothyroid case if she doesn't pluck her eyebrows and she doesn't. So this is a hypothyroid case because nothing really else does that. So now <laughs> I already knew that looking at her immediately. Now I'm going to work her up, work up her case because she came in recurrent kidney infection. So I have to relate to that to come back to it. But I also, what I would say right here, and I'm going to give you some clinical pearls here, is, is or practice management, I should say. If I saw that lateral third and I did, what I would say is this. I'd say, Mrs. Jones, you see that? And I'd take a picture of it and show it to her. As a matter of fact, that was my iPhone I did. Took a picture of it and I said, see that, see that right there? You should have hair out here and you don't. What that means is something is causing you to have a low thyroid. That low thyroid could be the very thing that's causing your immune system to be low and causing you to have this recurrent infection. Okay, let's say it a different way. She came in with shoulder pain, chronic shoulder pain. I would say this, you see this Mrs. Jones? That lateral third of the eyebrow is gone. That tells me you have a low thyroid. When you have a low thyroid, it can cause a lot of inflammation and cause a lot of aches and pains. And we generally see it can even relate to things like shoulder pain. I mean, I'm gonna just I'm just gonna walk this puppy right on down the road. If it's true, if it's true, if it's not true, I'm not making anything up. But guess what? It's true. Um, because the thing about it is, when we have a, a, a hypothyroid, it's not this isolated thing going on. When you have hypothyroid that's functional like this, it is proof this is a, a person that is not well. And you could you could name you know probably ten things that are going on. One thing we talk about is hypothyroid, but you could talk about ten things that are going on with this patient, and they somehow would probably relate. Now I did this right here because I couldn't see it, and I just did this this afternoon. If you look at this right here, you see that I blew that up. You see that right there. That is a diagonal crease in the ear. So what did I do? I told her, I said, look, you've got a diagonal crease in your ear, and that place right there in your ear, the supporting structure is very susceptible to drops in circulation. And when you have drops in circulation, we will see many times that diagonal crease. And you know what I said after that? We're going to need to get some labs on this. And by the way, when I saw that and I showed that and I explained it to her in the immune system, I said, we're going to have to get some labs on that. I didn't have to convince her to get labs. She was already ready to go. Also, I didn't even know this. This is an accidental finding from, from, from uh, me taking this picture. But look right here. See the hair on the face right here? You see that right there? That is consistent with insulin resistance. You see that like that peach fuzzy hair growth on the side of the face, lower than the sideburn, but on that cheek part right there. Dry skin. Here's her feet right here. So we've got some dry skin. And uh, we've also got a little fungal going on down here. We have a little fungal. And you can just look at these feet and see how dry they are, see? So uh, here again, if I was somebody came in to me, they're having, um, uh, they're fatigued. They come in, they're fatigued and always having headaches and they have problems with their periods, right? If that was the case, and this lady's 35 years old, which these are not 35-year-old feet, but just go with me on this, and I saw that, I would take a picture. This is practice management. I would take a picture, and I would say, 
you see those dry feet there, Mrs. Jones? And she said, yeah, I've noticed that. It gets worse in the winter when I have to turn on the heat. Yeah, you betcha. And you see that fungal toe right there? Yeah. You know, this can be a sign. It could be many things, but one of the top things could be an underfunctioning thyroid. And that underfunctioning thyroid very well be, could be causing your fatigue. It could be causing the chronic headaches. It could be causing all these things. We need to get some labs on this so we can understand what is going on with you so we can build a strategy to help you overcome this and really get to the root of the problem. I mean, it really is that simple, and, and people are not going to generally say, no, I don't want to do that. I mean, you'll get a knucklehead every once in a while, but if somebody comes to your office, that's proof positive that they're wanting to get well. Okay, so dry skin, but look at this, look at this uh, circular, uh, the brown right there. That's a sign of dry, and I don't like the way that looks, by the way. These, that's circulation. So, so not only thyroid, but I'm going to talk to this lady about circulation. If you have low thyroid, you can most de it can definitely be tied to low circulation cardiovascular disease. So, this is a close-up picture. Now you see that fungal right there, and see how dry those feet are. If you look at people this closely, you'll see this kind of stuff. And now watch this. You see, when, you, when you're sent in the anatomical position, you should not see the back of the hand. Um, and, but you see the back of the hand on both these cases. The reason why you see that is because the shoulders are rolled forward. Those shoulders are rolled forward. That generally, not 100%, because you can have some cerebellum problems that'll do that. You can have some brainstem problems that'll do that, but you can also have a problem in the adrenal loop, the brain to adrenal to body to brain loop uh, that'll cause that as well. So, you know, who knows? But anyway, she does have anterior. But guess what this is also going to cause? This is going to cause chronic neck and upper back pain. This patient's going to come in. They're going to get adjusted. They're going to feel better. They're going to come back in two weeks, and they're going to tell you, two days after you adjusted me, I walked out of the car or got out of my car, and I lost my adjustment. I'm going to say, no, you didn't. You, you know, you got low. You got a bad adrenals, or you got bad, you know, cerebellum, something like that, right? Okay, so palpation of the thyroid gland should be part of the routine exam on everybody, not just this lady. So uh, you get down there, and the way I do it is I'll palpate the lymph nodes around here, go to the posterior cervical chain, anterior cervical chain, and then I'll come down here, and then I'll have them swallow, and then I'll feel for it. And you will be amazed. If you're not doing this right now, you need to start doing it on your patients. Even take some of your regular patients and start doing it on any of these people. Anybody you see some of these signs I've talked about, start doing this. You'll be amazed. You're going to find some, uh, you're going to find some swollen thyroids. And as soon as you do, you're going to tell that person. You're going to say, um, you're going to say, um, we need to get some labs on that. And you know what? They're not, you know, of course people know this. We didn't make this stuff up. This is traditional stuff. But who's doing this? What medical doctor down the street is doing this kind of thorough workup? They are not. They are not. That's the reason why we can be number one in this position. People can look to us because they want to they want a good workup so somebody figure out what's causing the problem. And most people are going are wanting to go natural. I wouldn't say most people, but I would say a deluge of people, a tidal wave of people are wanting to go natural. They just want to find somebody like me and you that can help them walk through this and do it right and uh, do it responsibly. So skin tags, of course, you see a skin tag right there. That's a sign of insulin resistance. Here again, that's traditional medical stuff. That's not something we found on a website somewhere. That's, that's traditional stuff. Uh, acanthos nigricans. This is on this lady right here. So she has insulin resistance. So now what I'm going to say here is I know looking at this, most likely this is not a primary thyroid problem. I see she has cardiovascular disease going on. I see she has insulin resistance, and I know she's inflamed and she's manifesting all these low thyroid signs, something's burning in here. And that's how I'm going to talk to her. I'm going to say, you know what, you got a fire going on there. We better figure out what that is. Uh, I understand you have weight gain. I understand you have fatigue. Uh, and I understand you have recurrent infections, and those are important. We need to address that, Mrs. Jones. But I'm going to tell you something. You've got a fire going on in there, and if we don't address that, it's liable to ca uh, cause a lot more serious problems than we're dealing with right now. It, you know, just the fact that it's causing you, you know, quality of life issues right now, we need to deal with this, but we need to get a handle on this. You talk to people like this, and they will listen. 
All right, so you can't really see this well, but this pallet went up to here and you can't see that one. So actually the right pallet didn't come up as well. So what we do is we have people say ah, and both pallets should rise equally. And then you stick a tongue depressor in there, stick it back on the pharynx. And if they don't gag, these are signs that they have a cranial nerve deficit of cranial nerve 9 and 10. And why is that so important? Well, for a chiropractic standpoint, and for any standpoint, it's important uh, because here we have the atlas right here, we have the vagus nerve comes down here, and the vagus nerve is the primary communication between the, uh, the gut, including the liver, everything in the gut, and the brain. So the brain-gut, gut-brain axis completely hinges, completely 100% hinges on that vagus nerve. So if somebody doesn't gag well or that doesn't lift up well, the vagus nerve also does that. So that's an indication that we're not getting good communication. And guess what? The vagus nerve is responsible for blood supply to the gut. Vagus nerve is responsible for motility of the gut. And the vagus nerve is also responsible for the enzymes, the digestive proteolytic enzymes that come out of the pancreas. And guess what? So much more. So, so that vagus nerve needs to be working. We do upper cervical, so we address that vagus nerve by doing our upper cervical work. Uh, something else you can do is you can actually have people gag and gargle. Those are just two things. Have them gag. When they, when they brush their teeth in the morning, have them gag for about 30 seconds, gag themselves with a toothbrush. Keep on doing that for about a couple of weeks, and you'll find that that vagus nerve will actually start livening up some. Okay, just a clinical tip. All right, so you see the red dots at the end of the tongue, and here again, this is not a traditional, this is something that comes from Eastern medicine. When you have the red dots at the end of the tongue, basically it means the level of stresses on the system is greater than the body's really handling. Okay, so I had her do a heel-to-toe talk. Why did I do this? When I have a thyroid case, I always check the cerebellum very closely because if you have an inflammatory problem, an inflammatory process causing that thyroid to go down, many times it can cause the cerebellum to go down as well. So I'm going to check this on this case. I don't know if you can see that, but uh, we had her do... Okay, look at me when you do it. A little slower, a little slower. You have to do, have to do it slow because they can fake through it. Yep. Yeah, so she's wobbly, so she does have a cerebellum. Uh, I did this one. She had a very small bit of endpoint tremor. You can see a little bit of a shake at the end. Boom, just a little bit. But endpoint tremors mean a cerebellum issue. Okay? The next one I did is I had her walk. Now, when you have somebody walk and you watch their arm swing, you'll watch her left arm. Watch her left arm, and you'll see it kind of slings up um, kind of loosely. And that's called hypermetric, and that's consistent with a cerebellum. Just watch this. Watch that left arm just kind of slinging up like that. Just not. It's not real. Um, it's not real um, uh, in a neat groove. Okay, so just cerebellum issues. So we're going to look at cerebellum. We're going to do our upper cervical work, but also our inflammatory stuff is going to help that a lot. Okay, so abdominal exam starts with auscultation. Hypothyroid may have decreased bowel sounds. Of course, you want to palpate all your organs and do all the stuff you do. I did a kid kidney punch on her. What you do is you place, uh, you, you know, here's the back right here. You place your hand over, and then you punch your hand. Not hard, but you punch it right in that kidney region. And if they have an infection in that kidney, uh, that will generally cause them pain. In this particular case, I did it for this lady. It did not cause any pain. So I was actually relieved about that because she came in initially, you know, because of the recurrent kidney infection. Here's my findings. She had lateral third of the eyebrows, dry skin, enlarged thyroid, bilateral, fungus toe, decreased bowel signs. And if you want to, you can put this whole bag right here into a low thyroid. That's kind of what I attributed that to. She had skin tags, acanthos, nigricans. Those are very strong indications of insulin resistance. She had red dots at the end of the tongue, anterior rotation of the, uh, the shoulders. I don't know completely about this one, but it looks like she probably has some adrenal uh, loop problems. I call it adrenal loop because adrenals are just responding gland as well. It's the brain to the adrenal axis. Heel to toe, arm swing, finger to nose. These are all cerebellum issues. By the way, this exam took me about 15 minutes only. Uh, diagonal crease, discoloration. Here's a cardiovascular disease, and this is our vagus nerve right here. So these are basically the things that I saw. So now, 
let me just take a moment and say this. If, if this person came in and they had uh, shoulder pain, somebody comes in and they have shoulder pain, and I see anterior rotation there, I see skin tags, and I see lateral third. I would say this, Mrs. Jones, see the lateral third of your eyebrow out there? That's an indication that you have a low thyroid. But you might not have a problem with the thyroid. There might be something else going on that's just pulling your thyroid down. And I believe that could be true because when we see these skin tags, it's usually because people have problems with sugar dysregulation. It might not be diabetes. It might be. We don't know until we check. But, uh, you know, some sugar dysregulation. But this anterior rotation of the shoulders is probably connected that in some way to that skin tag right there. And that chronic rotation of the shoulders, I think that really might be causing that chronic pain between in your shoulders and the pain between your back. We are going to need to get some labs so we can understand why this is happening. It's really that simple. If you want to, I'll do this. I'll say it this way. I'll say, Mrs. Jones, you came in, you had fatigue, you had um, uh, lateral, uh, you had fatigue, you had weight gain, uh, you had high blood pressure, and you had depression. And let me just say from the exam I just did with you, it looks to me like the root of this problem is coming in those things I've discussed. We need to get some labs so we can look at your liver. I want to look to see if you have infection. I want to see uh, what your blood sugar looks like. I need to see your cholesterol, and you name the list. And then you get the test and you get it done. And so that's, that's how you do it. And we've discussed how to do that in, in prior ones. Uh, I just have about 10 minutes here, and I really want to go through this blood and field question. So I'm going to do my best. So we have cholesterol, and it is a 270. So we recognize that as being high. Uh, now, remember, cholesterol to triglyceride ratio, we want that to be 2 to 1. When it goes closer to 1 to 1, that's a sign of insulin resistance. And, of course, she's just about 1 to 1. There's another even clear-cut sign of insulin resistance. If you have a triglyceride, I'm sorry, if you have triglycerides divided by HDL, and if you're over 3.5, you are assured that is insulin resistance. And so she's 2, 255 divided by 46. I don't know what that is right offhand. It's going to be somewhere about 5 to 1. You know, it's going to be somewhere about 5. So this lady is absolutely screaming insulin resistance. And guess what? She's doing things natural. She's taking something to lower her cholesterol naturally. She's taking something to uh, improve her insulin resistance naturally. Guess what? It's not working because it's not going to work. That stuff doesn't work. You can't use nutrition like you use drugs. You have to figure out what's causing the problem and explain it to the person and just work them through it. Now see this right here? She's not diabetic, but she's definitely pre-diabetic. So she's at 104, all right? We have, um, okay, so we have creatinine and BUN is low. This is actually a sign of the catabolic process. That means that, remember, muscle metabolism releases creatinine, and when your creatinine goes below 7, it generally move, means you're losing protein from your muscles because your body is trying to use that protein for fuel to help you fight the inflame, the inflammation. So a lot to say there, but I've, I've covered that in previous webinars you can get. Uh, sodium is at 139, anytime it's below 140. Of course, we think there's something wrong with that, um, with that adrenal brain to adrenal back to brain loop. So there's definitely something going on there. Her uric acid is way high. She's just way inflamed. This is all signs of the catabolic process here. So all that's very strong in this case. Uh, her TSH is actually 4.17. So let's look at some of these numbers, okay? So let's look at the numbers. Here's the nose. Here's the mouth. Here's the thyroid. Here's the pituitary. So a normal TSH is going to be 1.8 to 3.0. And um, she's at 4.17, so that's high. What that means is, is the brain is sensing that there's not enough thyroid out, so it's carrying it out. Now, until you go over 4.5, it's not clinically called hypothyroid, so we would call this a functional hypothyroid. So let's look at some more numbers that are important. Uh, let's look at the total T4 is 9.8, and the total T3 is 106. Okay, so let's look at this. So the total T4 
is 9.8. The, the normal on that is going to be 6.5 to 12.0. And then it's going to go through this enzyme here, that 5' prime deodinase enzyme. And the total T3, the really good spot for that is going to be 115 to 180. Now watch this. And hers was what? Uh, I have to look again. So sorry, it's 106. So hers is 106. Now watch this. This is so important. Her T4 is 9.8. That is about in the middle, maybe a little higher than the middle of that range. So if she's converting well, I would expect her total T3 to be somewhere about 140 to 150. It is not. It's 106. So what does that tell me? That tells me she's not converting. She's under converting. So she has two things going on with the thyroid. Something is inflaming this thyroid. Something is making, uh, I'm sorry, something is causing the brain to uh, say, hey, there's not enough thyroid. Inflammatory process that's going on is probably related to insulin resistance. Uh, and something's bothering this enzyme that's, that's not converting well. That's probably related to insulin resistance as well. Um, let me go on. I've got a few more minutes here. I'm going to clean this up because I'm going to talk more about this in just a little bit. Okay. Okay. So the white blood cells way up there at 10.7. She's got an infection. Uh, remember our numbers. Uh, if you're not fighting anything, 60, 30, and we want to see the monocytes under seven. We want the eosinophils under three. So predominantly, she's making new, a lot of neutrophils, but not a lot. I mean, she's not fighting this thing very well, really. So. Um, so it's just kind of laying there. So she does have an infection. I do believe it's bacterial. And then we come down here, we look at the UA, we do have bacteria. This doesn't tell me bladder infection, kidney infection. I don't think it's a kidney infection because the uh, kidney punch sign wasn't there and I don't see any hyaline cast. So I'm going to treat this as a UTI or a bladder infection. That's exactly what I'm going to do with it. Her C-reactive protein, anything over 0.1 is going to be high. So that's what that looked like and her vitamin D was fine. So here's the numbers. Uh, I've written this out. Uh, here's, uh, here's what we found on the labs. Uh, now, let me take you through this process. Let's stop. Let's take a breath. And let's look at it this way. When you have a patient come into your office, I've encouraged you guys to do this over and over and over. We do something called bail them out. The bail them out. B stands for blood sugar and body balance. So. Can you see anything on here that shows us about blood sugar issues? Here's one right here. Triglycerides to HDL ratio, that's that. Fasting glucose, those are all sure signs of, of blood sugar dysregulation. Did she have any signs of anemia? She did not. Did she have any signs of adrenal thyroid? Yeah, she did. Elevated TSH, uh, depressed sodium. Those are all signs of that. Of course, we're not going to work on that um, at this moment. Uh, I stands for infection or inflammation. She does have an infection. We see an active infection. She does have inflammation. That might be the, the infection, but you know what the insulin resistance she has. I know she has inflammation. Um, and with the insulin resistance she has, there's no way she doesn't have you know, liver issues. So let's back this up. When we look at the bail process, I'm only going to look at a few things. I'm going to look for somebody's blood sugar, Initially, I'm going to look for anemia. I'm going to look for infection. I'm going to look for inflammation. And I'm going to look at the liver GI. So when I start a patient, no matter what they come in with, whatever their symptoms are, I'm going to bail them out. I'm going to look at these issues first, and then I'm going to broaden my search as I need. But if I do not look at these issues, if I do not address these issues, this person is not going to respond, is not going to completely get well. You cannot completely get well until blood sugar is better. You can't completely get well if anemia is still there. You can't completely get well if you have a chronic infection. You can't completely get well if you've got a food sensitivity or something causing inflammation. And you can't completely get well if the liver GI is all messed up. So we always, always, always start there. And if you can see on this patient, we didn't see the anemia. But we saw everything else. So guess what we're going to do? That's where we're going to start. We start with our chiropractic adjusting. I do upper cervical. You do your own technique there. Um, so that's going to help us with the body balance there. I'm going to start this lady on blood sugar boot camp. She's coming in this week. I haven't seen her yet. Uh, this I haven't done the report yet. 
uh, blood sugar boot camp the initial two weeks with the emphasis on modified ketogenic. I'm going to put her on a ketogenic because her insulin resistance is so bad that I really want to get that knocked out. Um, and then I'm going to follow up in two weeks with a protein uh, uh, green blend continue with the diet. I'm going to have this patient monitor, uh, monitor acid-base balance because I know she's way acidic and I just need to get a handle on that and see what's going on with that. I'm going to use liposomal C, 10 grams a day for six days. I'm going to do ACS 200 silver, 18 sprays four times per day for two weeks. Then I'm going to recheck the UA weekly until the infection clears. Or I go three weeks down the road and I'm not budging that thing. I'm changing tracks. I'm going to do something else to get this infection out of there. Uh, once the infection clears, I will start her on an exercise program. I'll start just some light walking, something like that, nothing major. But over the course of a few weeks, I'm going to have her doing interval training. Uh, when she comes in on her next visit, I'll do a hemoglobin A1C. I know she's pre-diabetic, but I want to see the number because I want to come back and let me retest that. So I'm you know, checking my progress. I will recheck the CBC to look for infection next time. I'll look at the CB, CMP to look for a bunch of things. I want to see what's going on with the liver. I want to see what's going on with the uh, sodium. I want to see what's going on with the glucose fasting. Uh, LD, I want to make sure that doesn't bounce down because she might go into a hypoglycemia if, we, if things aren't working right for her. I'm going to check the TSH, see what happened there, and see if we need to do more support for the thyroid or call it a day. I think we're probably going to call it a day. We probably won't need to do much more. Uh, probably won't need to do much more past that. Okay, so I do have audio now, so I'm going to entertain questions. Dr. Anderson, are you there? Yeah, I think, can you hear me? Yes, I do hear you. Got a microphone that works, so... I had two questions I see here. Okay. First one's from Marcy. She said, is tongue scalloping indicative of issues other than thyroid? Yeah, certainly can be. Any inflammatory process can do that. But you know what I find is when you see those deep grooves in there, like if you see the scalloping but it's not really a heavy scalloping, I don't always think of that as thyroid. But when you see those deep grooves like we saw in this presentation, um, you're, you know, a lot of times you're going to think thyroid, but certainly it could be any inflammatory process doing anything creating inflammation. And when I think about things creating inflammation, whoops, when I think about, whoops, sorry about that. Hold on. Uh, I don't know what just happened to me here. Okay. There we go. When I think about things causing inflammation, I'm going to think about things like low grade infections. I'm going to, to bail them out. I'm going to think about blood sugar. I'm going to think about uh, liver GI. I'm going to think about, um, you know, anything like this. Call, anything creating inflammation is going to be, you know, what I'm going to look at. But keep in mind, when I see all the other signs intact, if I see two or three other things, I'm going to be like, probably thyroid. And, you know, back to Marcy's point, and I think this really cleans it up nicely if we say it this way. I did not look at that thyroid panel because I wanted to diagnose her with hypothyroid. I already knew that was there. But I also had a very strong hunch that probably wasn't the major deal. I would have done TSH anyway. I do that on everybody. But I, I did the full thyroid workup, including TPO antibodies and TG antibodies, because when you do the full workup, you can actually see why somebody's having a problem. Not why they're necessarily having the thyroid, but why they're having all their problems. Because the thyroid issue they're having is just a manifestation of all the rest. It's just an effect from the issue that you're trying to get to. And when I look at blood work, if I look, you know, I looked at this blood work and went back. What I did is I went through. There was no, uh, you know, there was no ominous signs. Sign of eighty eight wasn't there. I did have catabolic process signs, which I pointed out. I did have Balaam out signs, which I pointed out. Um, but when I look at blood work, I'm only looking for one or two or maybe three things that are really causing the problem, and so I can so I can modulate that so I can make the biggest effective change because. Because, like, for instance, if you see somebody has low magnesium and you try to give them magnesium, it's not going to work. That doesn't, that's not how it works. You, you have to always solve problems. So, anyway, I went long on that. But, anyway, you have another question. Okay, yeah, Susan Sykes, she's got a question. says, how do you tell a patient that you think they have thyroid problem when they insist that they don't because the MD told them they didn't? Oh, wow. Did you just put a T-ball up for me to hit? 
I'm just kidding. Somebody please laugh. You're supposed to you're supposed to go. You're all in peace on audio. I'm just kidding about this. This is a very serious subject. And that is this. Somebody comes in and I never come in in an argumentative stance. You know, um, you know, uh, what what is it? A, a friend uh, uh, convinced against his will is still of the same opinion still or something like that. So so you're really not going to. So what I do is agree and change. That's what I do. And what does agree and change mean? Uh, agree means um, you know, it's it's the old it's the old feel felt found thing. You know, somebody comes in, you say, "Wow, you have lateral authority. Your eyebrows gone. You have this. You have that. You know, whatever that is." And they say, "Well, my MD said that, uh, um, you know, that I have a normal thyroid." And then you know, then you just come back and say, "Yeah, yeah, I totally understand." You know, sometimes they, you know, these thyroids are really tricky, and sometimes, you know, the blood work doesn't really show it as well, and so on and so forth. But you know, we see these signs. You could be right. It might not be a, an underfunctioning thyroid, but it's something. You've got something going on. We really need to look at this, and let's get some labs and see if we can understand. And uh, we probably should just at least run a screen on the thyroid. Maybe we won't find anything, but we really should do that. I mean, I would go something down that track. I would, I would not, you know, butt up when somebody says, "Well, my medical doctor says." That uh, I don't have a thyroid problem. I wouldn't be say, well, you know, I wouldn't be like Pee Wee Herman and say, well, yes, you do. I, you know, because that's not going to work. And I know you know that, but but it's not really going to be that that helpful. As a matter of fact, what I'm going to do is I'm going to. Hey, Susan, are you there? Do you have audio? Yeah, I just, audio. if you have audio, I want to make sure I clear this question up, and and because this is really an important question. Um, do you, would, do you want to elaborate on that question, or 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 would you, from what I said, do you want to piggyback? Um, or maybe give me a specific yeah. instance. What's that? Yeah, I, I, the, yeah, I think what you said was really good about how you know agree, and then the yes, it's yes, the yes, but kind of thing, or yes, I am. Yes. Yeah. Um, and and not just jump in because I have a tendency, you know, like you said, right. to blow my nose. Yeah, um, ah, that's funny. Well, you know, yeah, and, and I see that, and I totally get that. Thank you for bringing that up, because this is, you know, yeah, half the people on, this, on the on the conversation had the same question, I'm sure. So, you know, here's the thing, is that um, I, I go, when I'm dealing with patients, I go from a very uh, uh, non-attachment. I'm not attached. Now, I love my patients, I really do, but I'm not attached to my opinion. I really am. And if somebody comes in and they say, you know, I think you're exactly wrong, you know what I would say? I say, like, well, you could be right. You know, I don't know. Let's check it out. Let's see. You know, uh, I, you know. Now, believe you me, when it comes time to lay down the, you know, the care plan and and the nutrition and what we're going to do and how they're going to do it, I am the authority, and they have to listen or they or they don't make it. But but when we're going through this process of discovery. Um, you know, yeah, and and sometimes you can just joke it off, say, "Well, my th my medical doctor didn't say it, say it's a thyroid." And I said, "Boy, I hope it's not, but we better check to make sure, you know, or whatever, you know." So just kind of, I, I don't know. I, that's kind of how I would play that. So, any more questions? We got two more here. Yes. Uh, Brian says, uh, "Do you like the product Biocidin for chronic bacterial viral infections that affect the thyroid autoimmune thyroid?" Yeah, a broad question. I will say this, that we do use a lot of it. We do use a lot of it. And, um, you know, biocidin has a lot of great attributes. I'm sorry, let me get back to this because I want to actually draw this. Biocidin has a lot of great attributes. Um, and let me just show you one. Let's say these are bugs right here. What they do over a period of time is they get in a colony and they build themselves this big biofilm. Okay, so that biofilm is um, not recognized by the white blood cells. So they do that, and so one of the things that biocidin does is help you break down that, helps you break down that uh, that barrier. Now, some of the like the Lyme and things like that, they can actually have two cell walls. So uh, and inside the first cell wall, these guys can have things like that are called efflux pumps. And so what an efflux pump is is this. The person takes an antibiotic and it goes in here and the efflux pump just pumps it right back out. It never gets to the center of the, of the bug. But the biocide not only breaks down, down the, the barrier, but it has been shown to actually shut down these efflux pumps. So, you know, biocide does a lot. So if I have a chronic infection that I don't know what it is, 
Chronic infections will always have a, a biofilm, so it is my go-to for those. If I have a gut infection, I'm going to use the drops. If I have a systemic type infection, then I'm going to use that LSF brand. So I hope that answers. Okay, go ahead. Okay, one more. It's from Rebecca. It says, will bailing this lady out fix her cardiovascular issues, or are you planning on doing some other treatment to address it? Great question. And you know what? If you hadn't answered that question, about 10.30 tonight, I'd have been almost asleep, and that would have crossed my mind. I said, why in the heck didn't I say something about that? So thank you so much. Gold star for that. Okay. So first thing, um, inflammation is the cause of cardiovascular disease. All right? So it's an inflammatory process. Uh, so in the beginning, I'm going after the inflammation in a very general way. Then what I'm going to do is I'm going to check my markers to see how I'm getting along. One month from now, maybe eight weeks, eight weeks, four, four to eight weeks, I will come in and I will run more extensive blood to have to do with the cardiovascular. I'm not going to do it now because her diet's so messed up, everything's such a mess, then I'm going to say it looks like it's terrible anyway. So I want to clean her up really good, and then I can really, because no matter what it is, I'm not doing anything else anyway. So in four to six weeks, if, if it takes eight weeks to where I really feel like we've had a good clear, the inflammation's down, she's feeling better, she's lost 15 pounds, everything's going great, and she's loving life, she's kissing me on the cheek when she comes in, all these things are happening, then I'm going to be like, okay, I might go to the cardio IQ on her. I just might do that um, for that to specifically look at to specifically look at that. Um, and then I might also look at my markers and I might use some very specific targeted nutrition for insulin resistance once we've got her on the keto, she, we got her moving and we're doing that, and let's say those number, numbers aren't moving as fast as I'd like, then yeah, certainly I'll do that. Uh, but keep in mind, I'm going to start in the very beginning doing very general inflammatory. We know there's an infection there. We're going to get rid of that. We know the liver's not working right. We know the sugar's out of control, so we're going to work like crazy getting that. I'm going to check acid-base balance because acid-base balance tells me so much information. It's so cheap because if I come down, I'm, she's four weeks down the road, just for example, she's four weeks down the road and now uh, she's feeling better, but her acid, she's still very acid. I know we still got a problem. We still got a problem. It's, it's, we haven't gotten to it. She feels better just because we took the first layer off, but she's got a problem we're going to have to address. And uh, was there anything else on that? Um, we talked about cardio. Was there anything else, Dr. Anderson, that we brought out on that case that we, that we saw? We saw cardiovascular, adrenals. Um, you know, I probably won't need to, uh, but uh, my next step, well, no, I, I'm not saying that. I'm not willing to say that. Uh, I really might run a Dutch test on this lady. A Dutch is a dried urine test for comprehensive hormones. It's really the best hormone test out there. I've checked adrenals, but not only that, but um, estrogen, so on and so forth. With the level of, 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 of missing hair she has, and it looks like male pattern kind of, I'm not so hyped up that that's thyroid. I don't have enough thyroid to tell me that. I think this could be a low testosterone. Low testosterone from long-term insulin resistance. I might need to look at those hormones to see if I need to modulate something through herbs dim or something in that way. So thank you for that question. That's all I can think of on this at this moment. Any other questions? Yeah, that was the last question. Okay, well I want to thank everybody for hanging in here. Uh, I, you know, from my end, I felt like the, uh, you know, I'm not talking about the presenter, but I think the presentation, the, the stuff that we gave, I think it's excellent. Uh, we, we did record this, it looks like, so we're very happy about that. So uh, at, for that, we'll call it in, and we're going to say thank you for everybody showing up. Thank you, Dr. Anderson, for helping, and thank you for questions. Thanks.